Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. So we are back in the studio, the reef is behind me. This footage is a little bit dated, <laughs> but um, there will be some changes in the tank soon, so it'll actually look a little different too, because that coral right there is not doing well at all, and I've lost about half of it. So I will have to go in there and trim, rearrange, plant something new, and hopefully it'll be fine. And that'll be that. Hey, Dwitster. Hello, Amar. Thanks for joining. Listen, uh, today's topic is about water changes, because I thought that was an important one, but let's talk about a couple of things first. Um, off the top of my head, Reef Trace. I, I would just need to remind you guys, that's a great app you can use to track your water parameters, keep track of when you're dosing, when you're changing things, when you're adding things. There's some really cool features built in now, if you want to buy the upgraded plan where you can keep track of all your fish and your, your equipment when you bought it, and um, you can keep track of your expenses. <laughs> you can go all in with this thing, and there's a lot to do there. But my favorite part of that app is notes. I love keeping track of my notes, seeing when I dosed phosphate or X, or when I did something else, I mixed up a batch of trace elements or something. I can take a picture of what I'm doing, I can put my title, I can describe what I did, and I can review it so I can see what I did last time, because it's not always the same thing every single time. So having somewhere logical and on your phone seems to be pretty logical. So if you don't have it, it's for iOS and for Android, I highly recommend it. Um, it's super clean looking, I'll be doing some videos soon that will come out on this channel that will explain different parts of the app to make the experience easier for you. Uh, this arrived this week. It's a brand new product that um, came out from Neptune Systems for the Apex system. It is the MXM module, which is the Mobius expansion module. I hooked mine up to the tank and that's as far as I got so far. <laughs> I still need to go ahead and add all my gear to it, but uh, it, I had some in stock and I sold them out immediately. They, they were gone like hotcakes. So I will have to get some more in if any of you wanted to buy one at this point. Um, and then, let's see, I have something. Let's see if I can throw this on the screen. I don't know if it's gonna work or not, but we'll try. Put it right here. May not work, there it is, there it is. So there's something in the work. Here's a little teaser. Just wanna let you guys know something is happening soonish. Actually, it's gonna happen in less than 84 days. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a big deal. I'm working on it now. It's been mentioned in this live stream by some of you guys, which is the reason I'm doing it. It was not something I thought of myself. I would say Kyle gets credit, but I don't remember. Maybe it was somebody before him. But at the same time, it is happening. It is something I'm organizing right now. Uh, the announcement will go out probably in the next week or so. And once that goes out, then you'll get all the details. But it's a big deal. It's going, it's something I've never done before. I think that people around the world are going to really like it. And uh, I look forward to interacting with you guys and uh, giving you something that you haven't had before. So <laughs> we'll see if I oversold it right there. I think I did not, but uh, details are coming soon. I'm going to go ahead and hide that so it doesn't just confuse every single viewer. Okay, that's gone. So let's talk about water changes because water changes are actually pretty important. Now, uh, I want to throw this on my screen so I don't lose track because um, otherwise I'll forget it. Okay, <laughs> so last week we talked about RODI systems and I talked about the importance of having pure water. So if you're using tap water at this point or if you're buying distilled water at the store and you don't own an RODI system, I'm gonna highly urge you to buy one. Yes, I sell them. I actually recommend them regularly to people. Here, I'll throw this on the screen for some self-promotion. I build RODI systems for my customers. They come with a one-year warranty. I sell a 100 gallon a day system as well as a 150 gallon a day system. But um, no matter who you get it from, you should get one. So buy it from me, you're supporting this channel buy it from someone else, you're supporting your reef, it's okay. I understand all of that. I just want to encourage you to definitely get yourself an RODI system that makes water. And you might say, well, they cost a lot of money. Well, there are different ones on the market and they're super cheap ones that are too cheap. I wouldn't buy them. There are some that are really expensive and I wouldn't buy it. 
I feel like the ones I sell are a decent price, but that's completely um, biased by myself, right? However, if you were to buy a system and replacement filters for the first year, according to my math, it will cost you seven cents a gallon to make water at home. And then in the second year, now that the unit's paid off and you're just buying filters, it'll cost you three cents per gallon to make water. It's pretty cheap. So if you're buying water from your fish store um, or, or wherever you're getting it and it's costing you more than three or seven cents a gallon, might be worth considering owning your own system. Having a system in your home is just so much easier because it's always available anytime. Imagine if you had to leave your house to go use the restroom. <laughs> Imagine if you had to leave your house to go outside to use the restroom, not like go someplace. Just that hassle factor would be awful, right? We are so spoiled having a toilet in our homes, having a sink, having a shower, bathtub. Why do you not have an RODI system to make your water? I, I don't get it. I can't, I've seen people with the jugs, carrying them out to their car. The jugs are splattered, they're dirty, they're covered in salt creep, they're covered in dust, whatever they slosh over in your car, your trunk. I just, I don't get it. I have never brought home water from a fish store. Not one time ever in all the years I've been in the hobby. I started with tap water, I learned I was wrong. Okay, my spiel is going on too long. You need to have one, I highly recommend it. Please believe me, once you own it, you'll love it. Obviously there's some precautions when it comes to running one, but the, the, the benefit outweighs all the negatives. Okay, so now you've got your pure water, we gotta mix it with some salt. And to make salt water, you need to buy a certain brand of salt. And there are quite a few brands on the market, so it comes down to which brand do you wanna use versus um, what others are recommending. So for example, a very common brand that I started off with in the early days was Instant Ocean. Still exists to this day, still works. There's also a version of the same brand called Reef Crystals, and that is still to this day quite popular. There's Fritz Salt, which is what I'm using this year. I switched over to it a couple of months ago. It mixes very well, very cleanly. I've got a little promotional video I gotta put out for them because they are my sponsor of this channel, so uh, full disclosure, it, it's not a, a thing, like I'm not sold out to the man, okay? But I have used Fritz in the past. They offered to let me use it again. I was like, absolutely. And when you mix it up, it's nice and clear within 20 minutes and ready to use. I really like that. I have used Red Sea Pro or Pro Reef back in the day. I love that. I used it for many years. I used Aqua Vicho probably for the last, I don't know, five, six years. And besides one little incident you guys know about, it went really well. So there are lots of choices on the market. There's Tropic Marin. Uh, I mean, there's Aqua Forest has one. Prodibio has a brand of salt. There are lots and lots of different kinds of salt on the market, depending where you're located around this planet. But when it comes down to mixing it, the rules are usually the same. You want to have a large container. You want it to be clean. You want the RODI water in there first, and then you add the salt mix. Now, if you're mixing just a bucket, like a five gallon bucket, you could stir it with your hand, but I wouldn't. I'd, I'd much rather drop in a small power head that will just circulate and make the, the salt crystals at the bottom dissolve and become salt water and not be, uh, uh, not be something I have to get my arm wet and sit there for two or three minutes sloshing it around and around and around. I don't wanna do that. So I would recommend some kind of a small power head to make your life easier. There are different ways of mixing salt water um, and there, there's a lot of opinions too. And then of course, there's the other half of the conversation where people never want to do a water change and only want to rely on dosing what the tank needs. And they will just reuse the same water almost indefinitely. You know, occasionally they'll do a water change if there's a need, but they don't do it regularly. And then you get the other end of the spectrum where they're doing a water change every single day. So how much water do you need to change on your tank? The general rule of thumb is 25% once a month. So you could take one day out of the month and change 25% of your aquarium and you're doing a good thing. If you wanted to do two smaller water changes during the month that adds up to 25%, you totally could. But if you have a 100 gallon tank, you do not need to change 50 gallons or 10 gallons a week times four weeks, which is 40 gallons. You don't have to change that much. You need to change 25 gallons. So rather than making yourself work so hard, do a lesser amount, It'll have less of an impact on the aquarium in a uh, potentially negative way. And you can uh, still perform the task needed to keep the tank healthy, to remove some of the, uh, 
the waste that's in the water, the uh, as you're cleaning the sand bed, you'd be siphoning out the sand bed. There's some benefits there to during the extraction process to clean things. When I worked in my tank last Sunday, I cleaned out the entire overflow box. It hadn't been cleaned in a solid year. I scraped all the edges down. I siphoned out all the waste at the bottom. I scooped it out, wiped it down with a sponge. And then I put in new clean water in the tank because I wasted some really foul looking water. And if I had taken a picture, you would have said that came out of your tank because the water was orange. <laughs> it was crazy. There was a lot of crap in that overflow box. So if your tank has an overflow with a drain going down to a sump, you should clean out the overflow box from time to time. Don't, don't neglect it, don't ignore it. It may have little filter feeders in there. It could have snail shells in there. It could have a fish in there. If you're never cleaning it, you wouldn't even know. So cleaning it out from time to time is a really good way to keep an eye on things and get rid of that trap to try to sitting at the bottom. It's like a layer of garbage. Just get that all out of the system. Um, so let's say you've picked a brand of salt and you are concerned it isn't good enough. Well, you can always come to Club Milos Reef and you can discuss it with us. We uh, have a great group. We have about almost 9,000 members and you can post your experience. You can tell us about the salt you use and if it's working great for you. You can ask questions if you're unsure about it or if you are just wondering who else uses it, jump in the conversation. We'd welcome you there. I think we would have a really good time and uh, everyone loves a healthy debate about salt. <laughs> but when it comes back to water changes, we want to mix it up so that the salinity is correct. And I use a refractometer. I've been using the same one for a long time. So this one came from Tropic Eden and it's, it's, made, it's heavy duty. It's made of metal. It's got an optical lens on one end. It's got the viewfinder on this other end. You put a few drops on here and then you look through at a bright light and you can see what the salinity of your tank is. And what I usually do is I will, you know, add my drops. I will look at a very bright light in my kitchen and inside here, you will see a graph on the end, I'm sorry, a, um, a scale. And then the lower half will typically be, I'd say white. And then the above, the above part is blue. And wherever the blue and white line lands on that scale is your salinity. But after I've done it once, I then wipe it off. I put another couple drops and I do it again. And then I do it a third time. I always check three times because the first time you measure could be a little bit of salt from the last time and throw off the numbers. I mean, you might think your salinity is where it needs to be. These can be calibrated. There's, this one has a little rubber cap on the top. So right here, I would adjust a screw and it comes with a little handy dandy screwdriver right here so I can make my adjustment to get it right. So what I would put on here, you have different methods, but the easiest way is to buy some calibration solution that's 35 PPT. A lot of people make this mistake and they calibrate with RODI water and that is the wrong end of the scale. That is the furthest point away. We want to know as close to 35 PPT. So if you buy 35 PPT solution, put it on here, look through the finder and adjust the screw as you're looking, you will then get it to that magic 35 line and you'll have the blue line landing on the 35 PPT. 35 PPT corresponds with 1.0265 specific gravity. I really recommend this over any other method, but I know some people out there would prefer the kind of um, uh, swing arm hydrometer where they just scoop it up and they watch a needle bounce. I'm not a big fan of those, but boy, I mentioned that one like years ago and I thought I was making fun of it because it was so old school and it seemed like everyone that watched the video said that's what I use. <laughs> and I was so surprised. I thought this was the staple. Uh, there are people out there that also like to use the bobbing hydrometer and they really like the one from Tropic Marin. It's really big. It's about, I don't know, what is that? 15, 16 inches long. You need to put it in a, in a really tall cylinder to get the measurement or you've got to put in your tank, but the flow has to be off because you don't want it blowing around the tank when you're trying to read it. It needs to stay very still to get that accurate a measurement of your salinity. So now that you know the salinity of your tank, at this point, you can go ahead and you can um, verify what the salinity of your display tank is as well. So we know the tank, we know the new salt water. If they're both the same, that's perfect. If they're not the same, we want to correct it. If it's too salty, we want to add some RODI water to dilute it a little bit. If it is not salty enough, we need to add more salt, wait a few minutes, take another measurement, and make sure that the new salt water is the same salinity as the old. Now, if your tank for some reason is 
just suffered from low salinity, something got away from you, you weren't checking it regularly, then what you're going to do is you're either going to remove some tank water and put in some more salty salt water. <laughs> That's one method. Another method would be to top off with salt water for a few days instead of fresh water to get the salinity back up to where it belongs. And once you're there, then resume using RODI water for top off. Um, there are uh, calculators out there. Hamza is one I said wrong a while back. And that one is a really good calculator. It's got a ton of choices. And you can put in what your total water volume is. You can put in what the salinity is, what, the, what you want the salinity to be, and it'll calculate it and tell you exactly how much salt you need to add to bring the tank up to where it needs to be. Or if it's too salty, it'll tell you how to dilute it down. It's a great calculator. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's in my bookmarks. So if you need it later on, just let me know. I'll try to remember after I've you know finished this live stream to paste in that calculator in this video's comments, or I'm sorry, the... Uh, the video's description, so that way it's there available for you guys. Uh, the other two things I like to check uh, before I do a water change in my aquarium is gonna be the temperature of the new water versus the temperature of the tank. I want them to match. And then finally, I test alkalinity. But if you don't wanna do alkalinity, you can test pH. It's one or the other, just pick one. If you wanna test the alkalinity of the new water and the alkalinity of your tank, if they match, perfect. If you want to measure pH of the new water and then pH of the tank, you can do that too. If you have a pH probe, that's a super easy task. You take the probe and you put it in the new barrel and you just read the display and it tells you 7.95. And then you go put the probe in your tank and it says 7.96. You're like, okay, close enough. That is, I mean, that is really close. If your tank was 8.3 and your new water was 7.8, it's too low. I would buffer that up. And you can buffer up your new salt water with baking soda. It's really easy to do for me because I've been doing it for so long. I just know the routine. But again, the reef chemistry calculator from JD is another one that will tell you exactly how much soda ash to use to bring up the salinity in your new batch of salt water, whether it's five gallons, 25 gallons, a hundred gallons, it'll just say how much to put in there and you can just buffer it up. And in 20 minutes, your pH of the two vessels or your alkalinity of the two vessels, you know, the, the new barrel and the aquarium, they match. Perfect. So we've matched salinity, we've matched temperature, and we've matched pH slash alkalinity. As if those three are matched, you can really change a monster amount of water without affecting the tank at all. But you don't have to change a lot. I'm just telling you, you can. Uh, again, back to before I said change 25% per month. It's not nearly as much. Uh, it wouldn't have a huge impact. You're only changing 25% of the water. So you're not going to put a big dip into the system by changing 25%, everything will just be as is and it'll be stable and your fish will swim normally. Your corals won't suddenly retract, but certain things can happen when you're making new salt water. So here are a few things that may happen. You may ask yourself, uh, what if the water is cloudy? Uh, that was something that I did not like. So if you mix up a batch of salt water and it's really cloudy, as long as those three things match, you could do the water change and watch the tank clear up in a couple of hours. That's not my favorite. So what I ended up doing when my tank was cloudy, I was having some precipitation issues in my big saltwater vat. I just turned off the pump for a few hours or overnight. And then the next morning when I was ready to pump water in, all the stuff that had been in the water column had collapsed to the bottom of the barrel. And then I could just open a valve and pump the water in. And I was pumping in clear water and I felt better. It, it's, it's me, it's a personal preference. I don't like pumping in milky white water into my aquarium. I want to pump in clear water. I want the tank to look even cleaner when I'm done than when I started. But there was many times over the years where I'd done water changes where the water was kind of opaque. I pumped it in. I kind of looked at the tank. Everything looked fine. It just wasn't clear the way I wanted it to be. And so that's when I finally went to this point where I just turned off the pump and let things settle. Now, I think what was happening in my big container was that I was having the water tumble from the top down into the water, crashing through the surface and, you know, mixing. It's just tumbling and tumbling, right? And I think what was happening was CO2 was being mixed into the water, the new salt water, and it was precipitating out the alkalinity because the alkalinity would start to drop. And the longer I didn't use that water, uh, the more I noticed this lower alkalinity, but I would just buffer up what was left of my water and do my next water change. And then the next time I do a water change, if there was still a 50 or 80 or 100 gallons left in my container, I would check it again, I would buffer it up, 
I do that water change and then it's time for to clean out the barrel and make a new batch. And I have done that for many, many years, but I believe the breaking the surface of the water was my problem. And so what I'm doing now is I'm running it like a closed loop. So the plumbing, I built this a long time ago with different points of entry. One's up high, one's kind of medium, and one's down lower. What I'm doing now is I'm circulating from the, the base of the container. The water goes out into an external pump, which is the Vectra, and pumps straight up, and it goes to the lowest out point, so, or output. So that water now is closed loop. There's no mixing with air. It's just mixing. It's keeping the salt water mixed. And I have the flow at a very low percentage. I'm not running it. Uh, I mean, I'm not ready to use it, so I might have the vector running at 10%, just a little bit of circulation so it doesn't go stagnant. If you're making salt water or you're buying salt water from the store, there is a lifespan. It, it doesn't last in the jug forever. Normally, you would want to use that water within four weeks. And that's if the container was sealed shut. If the container was open, you know, like there was no lid on it or whatever, or the, the little uh, bleeder valve was missing and you've lost the cap, more likely some kind of contamination can get into the jug and we want to make sure that water stays pure. So as you know, best case is to not uh, use old salt water. Now, if the water was circulating, the tank in your aquarium is circulating. <laughs> it's fine. Yes, it's running a protein skimmer or some other kind of filtration. The other container, as long as there's a lid on top to keep it sealed from any kind of contaminants and there's some low circulation, just like, a, again, a maxi jet or a very small mag pump or a CJ pump or something in the bottom there will just kind of slowly gyrating the water around and around and around just to keep some movement, you won't get stagnation. But if for some reason you lift the lid and it smells funny, or you see mold inside the lid, or you reach in and the walls of the barrel feel slimy, or the pump and the tubing coming off the pump, maybe you have a pump with some tubing, and you just throw it in there and turn it on, and it's just moving water through the tubing, and all of it feels slimy, I wouldn't use slimy water. I would get rid of it all, I would clean everything, and then I would make a new batch. So by clean everything, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, two techniques, both work. Number one, you would grab like an old t-shirt, and some vinegar and water, and you would scrub the inside of your bucket or your barrel, just all the walls, take your pump out, clean your pump really good, take it apart, clean the inside of the pump, take the tubing and wipe it all down. And if you can pump clean stuff through it, it could be vinegar and water, it could be bleach and water. But then after you're done with your cleaning, you wanna leave the stuff outside to dry for a total of 24 hours. And after the 24 hours, you can bring it back inside and you can make your new batch of salt water with a nice pristine barrel slash bucket, and nice clean tubing, nice clean pump, nice clean salt. We want everything to be clean and, and not full of any kind of bacterial stuff that's going on. Uh, this is something you just want to watch out for and you want to stay on top of. It's really, really important. Um, what if the water's too hot? So if you had your salt water in a container or you had jugs in your car, in the garage, in the summer, and the jugs got really hot, I would not recommend doing a 25% water change. Your tank could be 79 degrees and those jugs, you know, you'll have to measure them, but they could be measuring 95 degrees, 100 degrees, whatever, because of the heat of the summer. Bring those jugs inside the house, get them near the tank and let them uh, cool off for like a day. And then the next day you could do your water change now that they're the same as the ambient room temperature, which is probably between 72 and 78 degrees, depending how you keep your house. I keep my house about 71. So if I had a jug there, it'd probably get close to 71 when you think about it, maybe a little bit warmer. Um, so you don't wanna use the hot water, but if you are using an automated water change system that changes a gallon a day, and it's pumping from the garage into your 200 gallon system, and you're changing a gallon a day, so you're changing 30 gallons a month, uh, that one gallon will not affect you. It won't matter that it's hot. It's not great, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that one. But if you needed to do a water change or let some crisis happen in your tank and you're like, I need a bunch of salt water and you brought in a bunch of hot salt water, that's a problem. You're going to need to cool it. You're going to have to get yourself some big bags of ice from the, uh, the local 7-Eleven, drop those in there, get some circulation, stir it around and uh, you know, wait for the bags of ice to melt, then measure your water again and get it down to what matches your tank for a safe water change. Um, what if the salt you use turned hard? That happens to a lot of people and it's due to humidity. So when you're scooping the water out of your container, your, your box, your bag, your bucket, your barrel, 
and you're putting it into the container, it is possible to get some water droplets on the, you know, the scoop and you go back in and you're pouring and you scoop and you go in and you go in back and forth and some water gets in. Or you didn't seal the lid tight on it and just humidity got in there. It's just sitting in the garage, just slowly baking and turning the, the uh, salt into a brick. Don't use it. I know, you don't want to waste the money. I get it, but don't use it. Once it is solidified, it's really hard. And trust me, I've tried it too. You go out there with a hammer and you're beating on it, trying to break it up. And you're like, I'm going to add to water. It's going to dissolve. It doesn't really fully dissolve. And some of it will be ruined. Some of the, the uh, trace elements, some of the, just the precipitation that occurs within there, the uh, calcification that's occurred, some things will just like bond and will not unbond. And it could be potassium, it could be iodine, it could be something or other. Whatever it is that's, that didn't fully dissolve, your tank's not going to get, right? You're going to have these nuggets in the bottom of your container. So I'm sorry. You've got to just be really good about protecting your salt mix from getting ruined. So if you want, you can, you know, like when I used to buy it in bags and I was making a small amount, I would then press out all the air and I'd roll the, the thing down and I'd clip it a couple places like you do with a bag of chips. And that way I wouldn't let any moisture get in. Uh, you could put it inside a container with a lid and seal it inside. So now you've got your bag that's tied off inside a plastic container. Again, trapping it from further air getting into it. That's another method. Uh, if you're using the full bag with every single batch, then you don't have to worry about turning hard as long as the other bags are not punctured and are in a safe place. I just, I prefer to have salt mixes in a, uh, uh, normal environment rather than a hot one. Now, tr granted, they got started in a place that had heat. <laughs> they got shipped on trucks that were not refrigerated. So, I mean, there is that. But once the bag is opened, that's the beginning of the deterioration. So you want to stay on top of forcing out any air out of the bag as best you can when you're tying it shut for the next use. And that way, your salt will last and it won't go bad. So these are the things I want to talk about specifically that we don't want to let any of them um, get ruined and we wanted to make sure that our tanks are safe. Now, uh, I did briefly go into automatic water changes. So that is where someone takes a device like the DOS that is connected to the Apex controller and they will set it up to where it's pulling out a little bit of water every single night and putting in new salt water while they sleep. And they will just set this up to run, you know, a certain duration to pull out a certain amount of water. And with automatic water change systems, there's nothing wrong with it, okay? There, if, if you want to change 3% of your tank per day, that seems like nothing, right? But that adds up. 3 times 30 days, it's 90%. <laughs> it's a huge percentage, right? Uh, if you're changing water automatically, you still need to get out your refractometer and double check your salinity. It's really important because between the water changes happening automatically and your protein skimmer pulling out waste and if the skimmer goes crazy or whatever happens during the month, it can change the salinity. So stay on top of it by measuring salinity every single week. It's all you got to do. You already have the water changes down to, I don't have to do anything. I mix up a batch, I'm done for the month. That's fine, but double check your salinity. It's not a big task, it's an important one, and you'll maintain the right number. And if something's going wrong, you'll catch it early enough that you can make some minor correction in whatever it is that's happening that is making the water too salty or not salty enough. We just wanna make sure we stay the same number week after week after week. Um, okay. Me, I love to take the water from the sump. I've been doing it like that for years. And when I take water, I will, I use a pump because I don't want to lift buckets of water, okay? I want to put a pump in there with a long hose that goes to the driveway or to a toilet or to a bathtub, wherever you can put the other end of the tubing, right? And I will then use that pump to pump out all the water out of the skimmer section and then all the water out of the return zone. And when those are completely drained, that usually is somewhere around 70 to 80 gallons for my tank. And then I can just pump new water in and turn the return pump back on. Some people like to take the water from the display tank. They enjoy it. They, they, I don't know. It's, there's this weird thrill that people get for different reasons. But for me, I don't really like seeing all my corals exposed to air and, 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 uh, puddling out over the rock, you know, just kind of like laying there, like what happened to my water? It, that's not a big happy moment for me. I just prefer not to do that. 
but it's okay if it's a brief duration, which goes back to the whole idea of using a pump. So if you want to pump water out of your display tank, instead of siphoning it out slowly with a tube that you're holding, you can do that. You can put in you know, the pump into the tank, make sure there's some kind of screen to protect from sucking a fish in, and you can l literally pump that water out rapidly into whatever, a trash can, a barrel, the driveway, but make sure you know when to stop. <laughs> That's a really important thing. We want to make sure that we don't take out more water than you have ready to go back in because we don't want to leave your tank with a deficiency where all of a sudden you can't turn on your return pump because you don't have enough water in the display tank. But pump the water out and then pump the water back in. Now, when we were pumping the water back in as I was a kid with my dad, he had gotten this thing from the hardware store that kind of looked like an aluminum grenade. That's really the best description I can give you. It was this metal round thing that screwed on the end of the garden hose and it had like a million holes drilled in it. And we would just put that aluminum thing in the tank and we would turn on the pump and it would push water in, but it would weep out all the holes instead of blasting water at the coral or at the rock or at the sand bed. So if you want to not use an aluminum grenade, which is what I would recommend, make something to where you can uh, protect the water from blasting into your display tank. There's a few little real simple things you can do. You could take a filter sock and put the hose into the filter sock and hold that on top of your tank and hit the on button and it'll pump water into the sock and it won't blast your critters. Okay, that's one. You could make a hook system with PVC pipe that goes straight up, over, down, and then maybe has a T fitting to push water left and right. And you could hang it on the tank, connect your tubing to that assembly and hit the, the power button for the pump to send water to the tank and it'll squirt out both directions. Again, it will not be hitting corals, it will not be hitting fish, it will not be hitting the sand bed. But that whole assembly needs to be glued together. You don't want to pop apart while this is happening. Um, and then there's other stuff on the market. I mean, there's, there's lots of things, you know, the strainer baskets that you put on the front of intake of power heads could possibly be mounted on the end of your tubing to squirt water into the tank to, again, not hit things specifically. Now, when it comes to doing water changes, if you are taking water from the display tank, that would probably be a good time to look at the sand bed and see what you're gonna remove that's dirty. So uh, a gravel vac is one system that's a long tube that has a hose goes off of it, and you can press it into the sand and you'll watch the detritus rise. It's, it's this brown funk, and then some sand comes with it. And it's, it's a process. It's something you have to learn how to do if you've never done it before. You just work your way through and as the sand gets closer and closer to the top of the tube, you pinch the hose shut and the sand will collapse back into the tank. You have to shake it a little bit, wait a little bit, and the stand, sand starts to fall. And then there's still water in the detritus. And then you open the tube and the detritus goes and it starts to grab another blob of sand and pull it up the tube. So you just want to kind of work the sand bed working way across. And you can do this uh, as, I'm not going to say, how am I going to say this? With a deep sand bed, the general rule was do not touch the sand bed. Leave it alone. Don't mess with it. But with a shallower sand bed, which is less than two inches of sand, you can siphon it and you can siphon it frequently. It's okay. Um, if you're doing a water change once a month, you are siphoning the sand bed once a month. If you want to only do the sand, sand bed three, four times a year, and the rest of the water changes, you don't touch the sand, that's fine too. You don't have to suck the sand bed clean all the time. There, that's not a necessity for maintaining a reef tank. And as your corals grow in, you may get to the point where you cannot get to your sand bed, like in my tank. I just, at one point, it's like, that's it. I can't get to anything. I would have to move corals completely to work on that sand and then put the corals back and then move these corals and work on this part of the sand bed. And so I usually work my sand bed about once a year. The rest of the time, I just let the Nasaria snails take care of it, the bristle worms, the pods, um, uh, any kind of hermit crabs, whatever is just crawling around in my tank, they disturb the sand enough. Plus the flow in my tank creates enough dynamic interaction that my sand bed doesn't become filthy. And usually my sand actually looks pretty nice. Um, but if you were doing some kind of a deep cleaning and you're scraping crud off the walls of the tank, you're scraping, you know, cyano and, and whatever's gotten on the walls, you can collapse it to the bottom. You could gather together with a scraper into piles. And then with your tubing that you're doing for a water change, you could siphon out the piles of garbage, uh, just get rid of that decay, that, that waste, that detritus, get it all out of the system. And then you will 
have a tank that's ready to receive nice clean water and it can be replaced. Uh, another thing that you may want to do when you're doing a water change is possibly look at cleaning the refugium. So the refugium area is that area that has the macroalgae plants and uh, sometimes it grows all kinds of ugly stuff in there and you may want to even clean off the plants. The plants might just look reddish, like there's algae on the algae, if that makes sense. So what I've done in that, I would take a bucket of used tank water. I remember one time I had a really bad cyano outbreak under my 280 gallon reef. The whole refugium was just red. It was so bad. And so I had four buckets of, of used salt water next to my sump. So I had 20 gallons of used water and I grabbed all the macroalgae, which was my feather calerpa. I pulled it out and I dunked it in the first bucket and shook it off. And then I dunked in the second one, shook it, third one and the fourth one. Obviously the first bucket was the reddest and then less red and then pink. And then the last bucket was relatively clear. And I did that with all the macroalgae and then I put it back into the sump. And now I had cleaner looking algae and all I did was just dunk it in different stages of salt water. That's all I did. I probably lost some pods in the process, but I had a cleaner looking refugium. And then at that case, when I was cleaning that refugium, I went all in. I scooped out all the sand. I washed all the sand out. I put the sand back in. I scraped all the walls of the refugium zone completely clean um, and refilled with new salt water. And it looked vastly better. But it's one of those things you won't have to do very often, maybe once every year, year and a half. It's not a thing you'll do with every water change. But using some of your water change water is a perfect time for some other tank maintenance. Uh, something I've watched Frank do at Frank's Tanks many times when he was changing water in his aquariums, he would grab the collection cup from the skimmer and he would clean it in the dirty salt water <laughs> and then put the cup back on. I mean, rather than carrying the cup over to the sink to wash it, he just had some used salt water and that was fine. You can wipe it out with your little, uh, your scrubby sponge, get it clean, put the cup back in place and uh, move on with your day. Let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Um, do water changes have to happen at all? There is a belief that you can get away with almost none. Uh, Triton was one of the first companies to make it a, 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 a thing from a brand. You know, it's one thing for a hobbyist to say, ah, I never do water changes. That's one thing. But when you have a company that promotes it, that's completely different. And they recommended a huge refugium, very few water changes, and to dose the lacking trace elements and major elements that you need to keep up with a nice healthy ecosystem. And they still recommend it. I mean, it's still a thing. So um, if you were a person like me that doesn't want to change water very often, and I don't. I, <laughs> matter of fact, I was, it, when you think about it, it's kind of funny. Uh, Fritz is my sponsor this year, and they gave me all the salt I need. Well, they're getting a great deal because I'm not a big water change guy. If I was changing 100 gallons a day, now they'd be losing money. <laughs> but because I do, what, six a year? That wasn't a big loss for them at all, and it's a win for them. But I mean, it's, it, it just kind of makes me laugh a little bit. But I do really like being able to do a water change when I need to, when I'm ready, when I'm treating the tank for cyanobacteria, or when it just seems like the tank could use some TLC and I'm gonna do this thing, I will go ahead and change water. But I don't say, oh, I've gotta change water because it's been 30 days. That thought has never entered my mind ever. Now in Caitlin's tank, it's a little different. Hers has just, you know, an air stone, a power head, a light, and now it has the Shark Pro filter. So with that one, I feel more obligated to change the water because there's no protein skimmer. Um, running carbon on the tank's not very easy. I mean, it, it's just, it's a body of water that needs a little bit of extra work. So I do change water, but on that one, it seems like I'm doing it once a month. I, I, I'm not doing it weekly. I'm not even doing it bi-weekly. I change about 10 gallons on a 27 gallon tank once a month. So, and that's just because that's just kind of how it works out when I'm siphoning the sand bed. I end up pulling out about 10 gallons of water. If I only pull, if I would just do five gallons, I would put in five and call it a day. But I usually have only done half the sand bed and I want to do the rest of the tank. And so I do 10. Could you add an air stone to new salt water to benefit somehow? No, I can't think of any reason that would benefit making your salt water better to aerate it. So I wouldn't use it as a method to mix salt water because it's too gentle. I think you'd end up with a, a pile of kind of clear looking salt that never really got mixed up. So I definitely would want to use a power head inside the barrel. And that way you get everything mixed up properly. And again, your water should look nice and clear when it's time to do the water change. 
Um, oh, I talked about pumping the water out and pumping the water in. I didn't explain how long. <laughs> so if you take water out of your tank, you want to get water back in as quickly as possible, in my opinion. I don't like to, to dally with that one. I don't want it to be a long, drawn-out process. I don't want to spend 45 minutes with a tank with all the corals exposed to air. And people will say, well, how long can corals be out of air? They I'm, I'd be out in the air. 15 minutes is okay. 20 minutes is okay. Longer, you're going to need to start pouring water over corals, you know, from the tank. Just scoop it and dump it over some SPS, if that's what you have, and kind of keep them wet. Because, and then the slime that's coming from them stressed, they will release all that and all that garbage come off the corals will go into the rest of your reef down below. Not a great thing. So if you are pumping the water out and pumping the water in, you're going to do the whole task in probably under 15 minutes, possibly 10. And that really is the best way to handle it. That way you're not exposing everything to air for too long. When you do a water change from the display tank and you bring the water down and you expose it to air for a while, any of your coralline algae that was doing so well may turn white and die. So it's another reason why I prefer to take it from the sump. Leave the coralline alone. alone. Don't mess it up. So I, um, that's why I think I probably got in the habit in the first place was going ahead and just pulling from the sump first. It was probably for uh, a number of easy reasons rather than taking from the tank. But from time to time, I do take from the display tank. If you have a variable speed return pump, and you have pumped water out of the display tank and the return pump was off, and then you're putting new salt water into the sump and you turn the return pump on, turn the return pump down to a lower speed to refill your tank. Um, that way you don't just send in this spa jet of water across your reef like I did once a long time ago. I did it, I pulled out a bunch of water out of my tank and I hit the return pump to get it to refill. It, it just blasted and water went everywhere and Jack was barking. My purple tank died on the spot. I mean, I really think I scared the reef. So I learned a very hard lesson to turn down my abyss pump to a much lower number to bring the water in at something that was a little bit less dynamic. <laughs> so like my return pump, I think it runs at 80% all the time. So I turned it all the way down to maybe like, I don't know, 55% or something. And that was water squirting in, but it wasn't like jetting across the reef. And that way you can have the water going in. And once the nozzles are covered and now it's under the water, you could go ahead and start to increase the return pump speed to a higher number to, you know, get the rest of the water in the tank a little bit more quickly. But I really do uh, think that's a, a really cool feature for DC driven pumps that you can adjust the flow rate down. That's it. I covered everything. All right, let me answer your questions. <laughs> um, I, uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in and listening to me today. I, I, it's always nice. So let us see what we got here. Alex is back. This is my first time back in almost a year. I really got into plants and my tank went to crap. I'm excited to be back and my passion came back. That's good. Sometimes you need a break. That doesn't happen to me, but to others, sometimes they need a break and they just need to kind of like, you know, get away from it for a little bit and then they return with a renewed passion, like you said. And that is not unusual. Luca is writing his book about reef keeping and says, I will be writing while listening to your live stream. Well, everything I said, use it in your book. Uh, Panopolis said, when installing a new RO membrane, you said to run or flush it for five gallons and not to use it for anything. Can I use it in the garden? I hate to waste water here in California. Yes, you could dump that in your, your yard. You could water some plants. But it's got food grade preservative in it. So your plants probably won't love that, but it's diluted, so it's probably okay. Hey, Rick, how are you? Let's see. <laughs> Guonk Reefkeeping says, uh, you know, greetings from Maryland. I replaced my RODI filters last night. The sediment filter was the color of a penny. Wow. That is too dark. Uh, you should replace those sediment filters more frequently at the very least. It's to, again, to let your RO system uh, get the right PSI across the membrane. Let's see. 
Uh, <laughs> Dances with Fishes says, RO is mandatory here in Arizona, lots of TDS, which is true. But watch out, mine broke one night and flooded my house. It may not be the tank that floods your home. That's the only downside of owning an RODI system, but that's anything in your home. Your water heater can flood your home. Your toilet can flood your home. Your plumbing in the walls can flood your home. Back in the day, I was working as a trim carpenter and I was installing baseboards and I'm in brand new homes. All you have are walls and openings. There's no doors yet because I install the doors. There's no windows. They haven't been installed yet either. And then windows would show up while I'm working on baseboards or I'm installing the attic stairs or I'm working on the staircase railing or I'm putting in, I think I said baseboards. Well, I was working this hallway and when you're working baseboards, you always want to watch out for plumbing that could be coming through the slab and into the walls. And so I'm, I'm in the hallway and to my right is a bathroom. To my left is the wall and on the other side of the wall is a bedroom. Bedroom, bed <laughs> with a closet. And I see, okay. So I'm shooting my baseboard on with a nail gun and suddenly water starts coming across the floor. And I call my boss and say, hey, um, there's water coming out from under this baseboard. And he calls the owner or his boss. And that guy's furious that I punctured this plumbing and it's gonna cost some money to fix it. There was no way there's plumbing in a wall between a hallway and a bedroom. That was clearly a mistaken stub up, you know, where they brought the pipe up in the slab when they poured the concrete. And then they didn't put any kind of protective metal plates on both sides on the, uh, what's called the, the base plate, which is the two by four. And they're supposed to do that. So that way you can't hit it with a nail gun accidentally. And so, you know, while there was grumbling, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> but the point is that was, that house wasn't even lived in yet. And somehow I found a way to make it flood the room. <laughs> so you, yes, but an RODI system, the best thing you can do, there's lots of things you can do. Um, one thing you can do is you can put a wet floor sensor under the RO that can make a lot of noise if it gets wet. First state, uh, first line of defense. The other choice you could have is after you've made your water and the system is pressurized and turn off, you could turn off the source water so that the only water left is the water in the RO system, but there's no water feeding into it. That's another choice you could do. Uh, there are smart valves these days, you know, where you can use an app and you can turn things on and off. And there are timers that some people have used where they hook up this garden hose timer to the hose bib connection, which is the same connection as for like a washing machine. And then they run the tube to the RO system and they set the timer to run for three hours or four hours. And then it somehow, it, when it hits the, the, uh, the elapsed time, it'll like lock, probably a solenoid closes or something, and no more water can pass through it, which eliminates the potential to flood your home. Also, the container you're collecting water in, use a float valve. And that I went into quite a bit last week. The float valve keeps your floors dry, uh, but it doesn't stop the RO unit from just running nonstop. So you'll have no more water in the barrel, but it doesn't quite shut it off enough. And you can hear the thing still hissing. And that means water's still going through the waste line into the drain uh, behind your washer dryer or your nearby sink, your bathtub, wherever you got the drain line going. So there is that. But yeah, you don't want to have a flood in your home and anything you can do to avert it is smart. Thomas, I'm glad to hear that your surgery went well. Sorry that you got hurt. Uh, Blinkyfish asks, what about the Hannah Salinity Checker? You know, I've used that and uh, it was okay. I, I just didn't love it. Um, the thing is you have to use their calibration solution. It has to be theirs and you got to use it frequently. And that's kind of why I stopped using it. I mean, I, I've been using this thing for years and I calibrated, I don't know, quarterly. I just double check and it's usually always right. I, the thing is, remember when I showed you, I'll show it to you again. So mine has this little rubber cap on the top to protect where the tiny screw is that you adjust calibration. Um, there are some refractometers out there where you could just put it down too hard on the countertop and it would change the calibration. Or you're holding it and you bump the, the, the adjustment screw. So this one here, the way it was designed, I don't have that issue. I can set it and forget it basically. And then I'm like, oh yes, it's time to check it again. It's, it's a good thing to do. 
but uh, I'm very happy with this one. I do sell a, uh, a, a different kind made from Deltec. It's on my website. So if you need a refractometer, I've got them in stock. I've had them in stock for a while. <laughs> but um, the, the benefit is knowing exactly what your salinity is and, and being able to verify that number. It's very hard to verify a hydrometer. It's not impossible, but it's hard to verify. Um, Bot says, I have a 6.5 gallon tank and I never do water changes. I'm sure all you're doing is topping off. <laughs> Whenever I water change, my nutrients bottom out and dinos start to coming back. So I only dose all for reef and everything stays stable. That's fine. See, there's so many ways to do a reef tank. That's the thing. We don't have one rule. Um, we have different rules and, uh, or different ways. And it can be frustrating for the hobbyist because they don't know which is right because there's like 10 ways to do the same thing. But hopefully through watching these videos, you get some basic oversight and you can kind of weed out the good advice from the bad advice and, uh, and be successful with your reef tank. Let's see. Uh, Andrea, thank you for putting those calculators in the chat. Appreciate that. And I'll paste those into the video's description later. A uh, hillbilly reefer says, I'm a firm believer in water changes, if for no other reason than staying on top of trace elements and bad stuff dilution. And also it makes me feel better. I think a lot of people do water changes to make themselves feel better. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> That's actually a good thing. If you were like, that wasn't worth it, that would suck, right? <laughs> so it's actually a good thing that you feel better. And a lot of times we just, you know, we, uh, what is that word? I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, amorphize, where we just, we change the water and like, oh, my corals are happier now. We can just tell they're happier because we changed their water. Maybe they're happier. I don't know. But I think that um, we, uh, I think we do that. We think we, we do it and we think we've done a good thing and everything's going to be better. I think it's the same with watering plants or feeding your dog or whatever. We know is the right thing to do. Uh, Gavrad says, do your skunk clowns ever fight? My wife wants to swap ours out and get anemones because of yours. They do. They skirmish. Uh, not all of them. So here's the way it works with um, clownfish. It's kind of a neat story. I learned this from a, a fantastic speaker who I was totally wanting to uh, get a hold of, and it turns out she died in 2021. I was shocked. I was so disappointed. I wanted to get her on. But um, she taught us that when it comes to clownfish in the ocean, that there's a hierarchy and they go from the biggest to the smallest. So when you see this one anemone when you're scuba diving and there's just all these clownfish in there, the reason they all get along, and it's not just a pair in this anemone, is because each one's slightly smaller than the next, all the way down the chain. And if any two are the same size and somehow they know this, they fight. So. And the idea is to get rid of the guy that's the same size to keep the ladder step look. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? And so they, they want each to be the next size, either up or down the ladder, so to speak. And uh, they want to chase away or destroy the one that is messing up their perfect algorithm. <laughs> it just, it's amusing when you think about that. I mean, how, how strange is nature at times, right? But so yeah, I see some skirmishes but I still have all 11 that I put in so many years ago. And they, some of them look a little beat up. And uh, one of them specifically seems to be, uh, I'd say has a dead eye at this point. I don't know, I'm just like, what's going on with you? But I've had them for a long time. Let's see. Hey, Chris, thank you. He likes my shirt. It's a good shirt. Very comfortable too. Uh, Jicker Mancini says, plenty of acropora are exposed to air daily on the reef, so it's entirely possible that air exposure could benefit them. Could be an interesting experiment. Eh, it's not all the acropora. <laughs> and there are certain ones that are completely used to that exact circumstance. But if you try to mimic that with your own tank each day and just drain it down and refill it, be very, like you said, be an interesting experiment. Could see how it plays out. Not so sure it would go well, um, but it, you know, it's one of those things that you're just like, you're like, what? Because I have a beautiful paint or a photograph of some corals in some acropora colonies 
fully exposed in the sunlight with the ocean around it, you know, where the water had gone, you know, the tide had gone out. And it's a great looking picture. And I don't know how long that duration is. I don't know how they do, how they get used to it. But yes, there are some that can do it. But as a general rule, leaving stuff exposed to air too long usually doesn't work well in our favor. Oh, uh, I can't say this. X Jester <laughs> says, put a water bottle on the end of the hose with holes. Yeah, you could make your own uh, aluminum grenade. Let's see, let's see. Joaquin says, I bought like 25 feet of hose from Amazon in a trash can and bought the carrier with the wheels. Makes my water changes 15 minutes tops. Yeah, that sounds great. I remember when I was doing my water changes on my 29 gallon. First of all, I had a stand that was really tall, like really tall, and then the tank was above it, and then there was a canopy above that, and I would stand in front of the tank and look at my little tiny reef. But when it was time to change the water, I would have to put a chair in front of the stand, and I'd have to take my five gallon bucket and lift it all the way up and higher than me, you know, standing on the chair to tilt it into the tank. And I was like, I don't want to keep doing this. This is not good for my back, my neck, nothing. <laughs> and so I called a company, and I, this was before you could buy things online, uh, you know, like we do these days. It's way different these days. But back then I called this one store in California and said, hey, I want some kind of tubing and a pump. And uh, cause I don't think I have something I could just buy at my local fish store for whatever reason. Why I didn't think I'd get it there, I have no idea. But this company out of Florida shipped me my tubing and shipped me my pump. And I would just put my pump in that bucket and I'd hold the tube on my tank and just squirt the water in. It was fantastic. Uh, when it comes to turning the pump on and off, here's something I didn't talk about before that we can definitely describe, you know, to kind of make sure you're doing it safely. You're working in your tank, you're taking water out, you've got water everywhere, your hands are wet, and you've got to pump the water back into your tank. So what do you do? You grab the cord with your wet hand and you look for a nearby outlet. <laughs> Not smart. Or you got to hold the tube in the tank and you got to plug the cord in that outlet that's just out of reach and so you're trying to stretch. It's also really hard to do. So instead, what I would recommend is if you can, get a six-way power strip that's near you um, and you know, plug it in the wall and plug in the pump into that power strip and then throw a towel over it or something to avoid any kind of incidental splashing or, or water spatter that could possibly get into those outlets. And then with your toe, you can hit the on button or the off button to turn the pump on and off. You know, and that way you can focus on holding that hose in the tank. Um, that's one method. Now, if you want to do something more fancy with a controller, you can. You could use smart plugs. You could use Alexa <laughs> and say, turn on water change, turn off water change, and it would activate and deactivate pumps. You could have a friend or a spouse or, or your kid turn something on and off for you while you're focused on the tubing and the pump and the hose. Oh, tub tubing, pump, and tank. Um, I mean, there's different things you can do, but the most important thing is to do it safely. So do that safely. Think about what you're doing and what can you do to make it safer. Every single time you should do better than the last time. That's really, really important. Reef with me, that's uh, Mina, says, is there such a thing as too many water changes? No, no. And if you change 10% weekly, that comes out to 40% a month. You're doing plenty. So that's okay. Joaquin says, I'm not a fan of Fritz, driest, no, dirtiest salt I've used thus far. I haven't come across that. I mixed up a batch of uh, 200 gallons recently. It was not dirty whatsoever. I don't know when you bought it, but uh, a lot of things have changed in the last few years. And you know what? The dirtiest salt I ever used was a brand called Oceanic. And I bought multiple buckets of it. It was something I could get here in Dallas. And I had this brown froth on the surface and a ring inside my trash can, my barrel. I had these 55 gallon barrels and it was just disgusting. And I would take a net trying to scoop it out and wipe it off with a sponge and oh, it was so nasty. I was like, I'm never buying the salt again. So I, you know, I get it. Um, but in theory, the salt should be clean. <laughs> Let's see. 
Uh, Todd says, how often do you change water in your anemone tank? That's a great question. So the anemone tank is part of the 400 gallon tank. They uh, share the same sump. So when a water change happens on the reef tank, it happens for the anemone tank at the same time. So I'd say six times a year. <laughs> Uh, Jicker Mancini says, do you have any tips for a new reefing channel? I talked to you a few years back about my coral spawning project. I'm now starting a channel. Nema to lab. Okay. Well, having a regular video come out every single week is good. It's key. And having good audio is critical. And having good video is great. <laughs> the better your stuff looks, the more people are going to watch. And if it's cruddy and trust me a couple years ago you know because i always read the comments <laughs> i can't help myself i always read the comments a couple years ago i had someone say to me on my you know on my youtube channel he says you sound like you know what you're talking about but your reef looks like crap and i couldn't disagree more uh, with him at all because he was right my reef looked like crap behind me because he's using a webcam and webcams cannot handle the lighting on our tanks it just never looked right so what I'm doing right now, I'm in my office area with my lighting and my, my camera and my microphone. And I have video playing of the tank behind me because if you took the camera and went close to the tank, it was beautiful, but you need a good camera. So whether you're using a DSLR, a, 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 um, a smartphone, you know, like the Samsung or the iPhone, you can get some great footage of your tank. You absolutely can. But to stand in front of your tank and film, it usually doesn't look so good. And I've, I got better a year and a half ago when I switched to DSLR only, and I hooked it up to this live stream software, and I would use different lenses. I remember switching out a lens once during the live stream to switch to macro, and I got behind the camera, and now you couldn't see me anymore, and I zoomed in on the reef, and I moved across different corals, and people were like, ooh, ah, I love it, because you know it's really nice to see it when it looks right. But when it doesn't look great, it's not so good. And when your audio is bad, people never forgive you. People will forgive bad video, but they never forgive bad audio. Audio is critical. I'm super picky about it. And unfortunately for me, because I don't wear an ear monitor, I usually have to rely on the comments as it's happening to tell me, your audio's messed up or your mic turned off. I, <laughs> there was a, some live streams in the past where it was like dead silent for 15 minutes because I was unaware that my mic had died. And finally, I'd look at the chat. I'm like, oh my God, when did this happen? And then I, of course, enable it or fix what was wrong or change the batteries. And uh, then people would say, well, can you repeat the last 15 minutes? <laughs> and it felt like such a failure. I was like, oh my God. But if you're editing your videos, you can obviously make sure everything looks right and sounds right. And you can do great stuff. So those are my suggestions for your channel. And then, of course, promote it on all your social media. Tell everyone about your channel. Ask everyone to subscribe to your channel. It's really important because um, that's the only way you can kind of get a following. But pet peeve of mine is when people come onto my channel and say, follow my channel. Uh, that's just something that irritates me. I don't go to their channel and tell people, come follow Milo's Reef. I've never done that. And so I wouldn't want someone doing that to me. Uh, Panopolis says, I remember the late, great Dana Riddle say, would say, if you don't have enough sand moving, it's not enough flow. Do you feel the same? I feel like I could always use more flow. He's not dead. <laughs> He's not late. He just gave a talk. And matter of fact, they brought in hula dancers as an intro or an opening act before he gave his presentation last weekend, which was really, really cool. So he's a, he's a great man. <laughs> <laughs> he's not late. He's still breathing. And uh, yeah, if you have so much flow, your sand is moving. That could be why some people don't have sand in their tanks at all, because they just want to have monster amounts of flow and not even worry about the sand bed moving. Hey, Greg, those baseboards, <laughs> you do not want to make any mistakes around your plumbing. <laughs> I just want to reiterate that. Um, I'm still working on baseboards in my house and I'm about to do my hallway. And the other side of the hallway is the bathroom, which is sink and toilet. So I'm gonna be very careful on that wall 
but in the wall that's you know behind me right now where I'm filming, that wall is in theory plumbing free except for near the air conditioner where there's a drain line. So again, I gotta be careful, gotta watch out. But I've been working my way room by room through the house replacing my ancient, probably came with the house 50 years ago baseboards and each room that gets completed, it looks so much better. I'm so glad I'm getting this done. <laughs> Mike says, I just got my ICP results back. I've been using the Eheim auto feeder since I work nights. And my phosphate was 1.4. Guess the Eheim has been working out <laughs> a little too much. Uh, so yeah, changing water can help. Phosphate RX can help. GFO, if that's your thing, can help. These are different ways to reduce phosphates. Um, I stopped using a auto feeder myself in my tanks when my nitrates went sky high because I didn't want to keep adding to the nitrate problem. But at this point, I could probably introduce a new one and it'd be okay. I could do some auto feeding. But right now, I'm trying to be a little bit better about putting in food earlier in the day instead of just waiting until 9 o'clock, well, 10 o'clock at night. Because I usually, I'm just, I feed at night. I have an alarm on my phone. It says, feed the fish. And it just rings and I hit snooze and it rings and I hit snooze. And I keep doing that. But it's to remind me to feed them before the lights turn off. And that's how I've been doing it for a super long time. Thank you, Christina. Anthropomorphize. <laughs> I said that badly. <laughs> oh, hi, James. Nice to see you. Nice to see your words. Panopolis says, how important is spectrum and for how long when lighting the reef for highlight corals and anemones? Well, that is a big topic, but... Um, Different points of view as well. So Sanjay runs radion lights on his 500 gallon reef and he apparently runs them at 100% like nine hours a day, which is just blows my mind. I cannot believe he does that. Myself, you're looking at my reef, it's pretty, it's doing well. Um, and it has been the same schedule for two years. I set up the sky, which are uh, an LED fixture. Uh, from Neptune Systems, and I installed that with my own schedule that I put together. And I have a three-hour period that I call high noon, which is late in the day, actually. It's at, um, oh, I think it's from maybe 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 7 o'clock at night. And that's where my tank, my lights run at 80%. And then after that, it so it, it ramped up. You know, it starts. It starts at zero, right? And then... Within the first hour, I'm at like 29%. And then I'm around, you know, a little while later, you know, another hour or so, hour and a half, it's at 54%. And then I'm 80% for three hours straight. And I go back to my 54% and then back to my 29% and then back down to almost zero and then zero. And that has been my radiant curve for a long time. It's how I've been doing this for, for so long. But specifically with the skies, I've been doing it for two years. And it works really, really well. I have seen no reason to run my lights at a higher intensity for a longer duration. I, I just don't see it. And I just, you know, I know, I, I, like I said, lots of opinions out there. But the way I see it, if I'm outside and the sun is rising, I'm getting some sun on me. And then it gets higher and more sun is on me. And then when it's directly overhead, it's crazy hot. And then it starts coming over here and it's less hot. And then it's warm. And then finally it's gone. And that's how I see it. That's how I've always understood the lighting over my reef. And that's how I've always run it that way. And yet others will say, nope, they're in full sunlight all day long. And they're like, no, they're not. They're absolutely not. They are completely not. There are so many things to take into account besides uh, just the aquascape itself that's in the ocean, the, the way everything is set up in the ocean. They're not all just sitting there perfectly level at the same height. There's different things at different heights. There are things down in ravines. There are things in crevices. There are things growing under things. They got things that fell on top of them that grew fast and shaded them. And they're not getting blasted with 12 hours of sunlight. They are getting some early morning. They're getting brighter light. They finally get full sunlight and then it's tapering off. And it's not a 12 hour duration of intensity. So I, um, and you know, bottom line, at some point, one of us, maybe me, will have to just fly to Tahiti and just stand on top of a coral head and measure the par all day long. <laughs> and get a number and then we can say what it is and how it works out because I just feel like 
even as the sun is rising, the corals over here are getting that light, but the corals down here that are in the shade of the one here are not getting that light yet. And then as the sun rises, more of the corals are getting covered. And finally, they're all being fully covered with light. And as this is going down, the, the light is on these corals over here, but the guys over here are getting less. And th this side of the coral is definitely getting less, right? Because the sun's over there. So, I mean, there's a whole thing happening. And uh, it's just not pure light like we do over our aquariums. What we do is very unnatural. And so I choose this schedule. It's worked really, really well. People, it's last I checked, it was the second most popular choice in the sky scheme choices of you know choosing different people's lighting. The AB plus continues to win, and then there's the Milev, <laughs> which is uh, you know the next version down. People seem to like it. Oh, thank you, Clyde. See, that was supposed to be on my list. He said, any experience in doing water changes when you change to another brand of salt? I was totally intending to talk about that. So if you buy one brand of salt, and then after a while you can no longer buy it, and you have to switch salt, or you find you just don't like this one, you want to switch, you could do gradual little water changes to change over from one to the other, and that way your reef wouldn't skip a beat. That is kind of the, the principle behind it, that's the thought process rather than just saying, okay, well, you've always had instant ocean and today we're gonna change to Fritz and uh, good luck. You know, that could be harsh, it's possible because let's say instant ocean, I should say reef crystals. Let's say reef crystals has a, uh, cause they have their own recipe. Each brand of salt has their own recipe. If they were all identical, it wouldn't matter what we bought. It's sort of like when you buy craft mac and cheese it tastes a certain way and we all love it then you get the knockoff from the dollar store and you're like eh, it's okay but it is not craft you know it just tastes different so the same thing with salt you've got this one but for whatever reason you had to switch salts maybe you didn't like the price anymore maybe you it was a lack of availability um or maybe they they made a bad batch and you're furious with them you'll never use them again if that's the case and you got to switch you can switch, and your tank can oftentimes rebound from whatever you do anyway if you keep things really stable. So if you do this water change from uh, reef crystals and you switch to Fritz, and your, uh, your tank seems to be, I mean, like people say, my corals look angry. I'm like, what do you mean? What does that mean exactly? But then again, what does it mean when corals are happy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't have these feelings that we attribute to them all the time. But if the corals look closed up after a water change, was it because the alkalinity, the temperature, and the salinity were not exactly the same? That could be it. Or it could be it's a completely different salt mix with a different recipe that is so different that the coral responded accordingly. Like, like I'm no longer in the Red Sea. I'm suddenly in Atlantic Ocean salt water. You know, they just taste it differently. Could be. It could be that it just seems different to them. So if you do smaller water changes, it's more gradual. The tank should not notice. So like the other day when I did my work on the tank, I, I did a lot of work on the reef. And I ended up changing 10 gallons on a 400 gallon tank. That was nothing. It was nothing. It was, just, it was a drop in the bucket, right? And uh, the coral, didn't, you know, the reef never knew. But if I keep doing little water changes, like 20 gallons here or 30 gallons there, the 400 gallon will never know that I switch brands. And they'll just think they're still getting what they used to get. Okay, Todd, thank you for asking this question. When will we see the new NEM tank? You tease. Um, tomorrow is Father's Day here in the U.S. Is it the same around the globe? I don't even know. Um, and I believe tomorrow my son and grandson will visit. But if for some reason they don't visit, I will have the whole day to myself. And if I do, I'm going to be making the stand for the 60-gallon Planet Aquarium cube. So that means the stand we built in the next few days, you know, because I got to cut it out first. Then I got to assemble it. I got to let it, you know, dry, cure, you know, all that kind of stuff, because I'm going to glue it and screw it. And then I've got to figure out what I'm going to do for color. I don't know what color to go with for the stand and the, and the matching canopy. And once I build that and stain it or, or paint it, it's going to be painted, uh, paint it, whatever I go with, then the tank goes in place. And then the setup's pretty fast because I will have to drill some holes through the wall to get the plumbing, the new plumbing from the new tank to go through the wall into the fish room to go into the sump. And then it's really kind of an extended version of a water change because all the anemones and clownfish are in a temporary tank behind the reef 
and I'm using a, an oversized CJ pump to push water into that tank and it drains back into the sump. Then I'm gonna add the new tank on the other side of the wall in the kitchen where it always was before. And I will fill that up with some live sand and I will put in 50 gallons of salt water because it won't be 60. And that'll be part of the whole system. It'll be draining into the sump. And then at that point, it just has to run. And if it runs with no issues, I can go ahead and I can grab the livestock and I can just put it in the other tank because it's all the same body of water. There's no acclimation. It's just a matter of getting the, the rocks and the anemones out of that tank and the openings were really small. It was super hard to get those rocks in. And to be honest, a lot of the anemones have gotten off the rock and got on the, the, the acrylic walls, which should make it easier for me, I think, because I might be able to get the rock out and kind of build my little simple aquascape and grab those anemones and stick them in the tank. And my plan is to put in the rose anemones and the, the white tip. Uh, they have a greenish tint to them, greenish, but they're not green. So I have those two that I want to put those in. And then maybe a few of the little ones <laughs> because I have like a zillion of the little ones, the nano nems. And let that tank just get going. Um, I just received new lights for that tank. And... Um, so it's all going to be coming together pretty quick here. Finally, after all this time, it's been over a year since I took that tank down. It's, it's embarrassing, but at the same time, it's reality. There, you know, there's just so many things to do every single week. And it just seems like I never have just three days of normalcy. There's always something coming up. So thank you for asking. It's going to happen. And of course, as the stand gets built, there will be some, you know, some way of me sharing it, whether it's video or pictures or whatever. And I will not be teasing you guys much longer. I will soon be running the darn thing and we can just enjoy it like we always did. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, Panopolis says, would you say a smaller tank, 40 gallons or less, should do more water changes as opposed to a larger tank that's 100 gallons plus? Um, it's not really the, uh, the size of the tank that di dictates the water changes. That's really the needs of the livestock. So if you have a 40 gallon tank and it's doing well with minimal water changes, great. <laughs> but if you find that water changes are the only way for success with that tank, then you gotta stay on top of it. The bigger tanks tend to have more stability in water parameters. They don't swing as hard. I mean, like we talked about Bots' little 6.5 gallon tank. The water parameters will change so fast on that tank, he has to be all on top of it. He has to be super aware of what's going on. And that's why he says, no more water changes, I'm just gonna use all for reef. I don't blame him. If that's what's working for him, great. If changing a gallon once a month made a difference, he would do it. But um, it seems like with bigger systems, there is more stability, but it doesn't mean you won't get to that tipping point where you have so much bad stuff in the system, you gotta do a water change. So. They do happen. Now, Joe's 20,000 gallon reef, he changes a, to be honest, I can't remember, but I do know that he trucks in something crazy like 10,000 gallons of water from the ocean to his facilities and he goes to this monster vat. It's huge. You walk around it like you're walking around an amphitheater. <laughs> it's just this huge amount of water that's circulating and then that will be used for all the water changes and all the different aquariums in that building, in the Long Island Aquarium. And, um, you know, I know he changes water, but I don't know how much and how frequently. But I, I feel like he does it a lot because I hear about these trucks quite often. If he was doing it rarely, the, the story of the truck coming in with water would be like this big news, but it's not. It's like an all the time thing. Let's see. <laughs> Panopoulos says, I support the quote unquote Mark standing in a Tahitian reef measuring power for 24 hours project. Well, it don't have to be 12. <laughs> Super Salty Reefer says, have you watched The Flash yet? I've watched the whole thing, all whatever that was, seven seasons. I finished it all. It was all right. It was not my favorite. Um, I really like the arrow way better than The Flash. Clyde says, I went from red sea blue bucket to reef crystals and did a 50% change the first time. 
and another 50% two days later. Man, you were determined to get one salt out of your system and get the other salt in. How did the tank do? Did it do well? Hi, Clyde. Thanks for chiming in. You sold me some T5s for cheap? Was it a super long time ago? I haven't run T5s in forever. Oh, okay, thank you, Lee. It says, Lee and Mandy said, Father's Day isn't the same in UK. I did not know if that was a global holiday. We have so many American holidays that I just sometimes wonder if everyone in other countries are like, what are they talking about? Okay. Daniel says, Father's Day is the same in Malta and in Europe. <laughs> I feel so dumb sometimes. Let's see. Thank you, Rob, for the super chat. I appreciate that. Clyde says, happy Father's Day to all the dads in the chat and whoever's watching this video. And I agree. Happy Father's Day to all y'all. I saw a memory, a Facebook memory from mine from like 2011. My dad had uh, sent me a message saying happy Father's Day. And at the time, I thought he was sending me a subtle hint that I needed to remember to call him. And then, I mean, this is a true story. So silly. And then it occurred to me, oh yeah, I'm a dad too. <laughs> you know, we all think we're still a kid. I mean, it just never stops. Uh, Reefing Weenies says, that's a great name. Uh, can you share your thoughts on doing the water change in the sump versus the display tank? That's really how I do it. I like to do it from the sump. Uh, if I want to do a bigger water change, I would draw, draw out all the water I can out of my sump, uh, from the skimmer section, the return zone, and possibly the refugium, and then grab a little bit more from the top, you know, from the display tank, take down two or three inches of water. But I'm not a big fan of like taking 50% of the water out of my tank and refilling it with 200 gallons of new water. That's not my favorite. I, um, I use the Seache uh, Utility Pump Zero. Utility Zero Pump? Zero Utility Pump? I love that thing. It's super noisy. It grinds away like, a, like it's making coffee beans, uh, coffee grounds. But uh, it definitely moves water and it's super convenient. And I can put that motor in my reef tank and have the hose hanging off the edge and going out the front door of my house. And the hole is so small at the bottom, none of my fish are gonna get sucked against it, which is really important to me. Because that is always a concern when you're siphoning. And you know, this happens to every one of you. You're working in your tank and then a clownfish goes right down the tube because you weren't paying attention to the end of the hose. So it is really good to have some kind of a protection on the end of the hose you're siphoning with, or, or just stare at it and keep your eye on it when you're working to make sure you don't lose anything on, you know, accidentally. You don't want to lose something you like a lot. Dances with Fishes says, Hey Mark, I got the work tray you made for me. I'm really looking forward to putting corals in it and see what, and in what has been my fish tank for a year. <laughs> nice. The work tray is super handy. I can't show it to you right now, but it's on Milo's Reef on the website. You know, I sell them, but I came up with this idea years ago and I call it the work tray and it's made of acrylic and it fits bigger tanks. I only make one size right now. It fits bigger tanks, but it doesn't matter what size your tank is because you use PVC pipes to, uh, uh, to stab through it, to set it on top of the aquarium. So if you had a, I was thinking about this the other day, if you had a rimless tank, you could, and let's say your rimless tank is 24 inches long, you know, or, or wide, whatever you want to call it. You could cut the PVC pipe. There's two ways of doing it. You can cut the pipe 24 inches long as well. And then you could take a Sharpie and you could look at the glass and you could figure out where you need to notch them. So when you put the pipe in, it kind of locks into place, you know, with a little notch. The other choice would be to make the pipe a little longer, like 26 inches long, and then uh, again, notch the uh, profile of the glass. So when you set the pipe on top of the tank, it will then, the glass will fit into the two notches. And again, the pipe can't move. The idea is that you put the pipes through the tray and you set this apparatus on top of your tank, lock it into place, and you can pull the tray towards you to work and push it out of your way. Uh, if you're doing it like I do it on my reef, because I don't have it locked on a rimless system, I have a tank with Euro bracing, I can roll the whole thing over and again, push the tray back and work what I got to work on, bring it over. I, I love that I can move it across the top of my reef. I will be sure to post a picture on Instagram and Facebook showing my work tray on top of my reef because I used it for my friend uh, AJ. He was here for Aquashella and he had just set up a reef tank a, a couple months before and he needed corals. 
And so I went into the tank and I was trimming him like nine or 15 frags or something. And as I trimmed them, I put them in the tray and I'd put the cutters in the tray and I could stand on the walkboard. I could get the tray near where I was going to go. I had the return pump off. I could look down, find something, snip it, put it in the tray. And then at that point I just brought the tray to him and said, here you go. And he bagged everything up for himself and took it to Austin. Uh, Clyde answers my question about the uh, the big water change. He said, it worked out okay, actually. Corals were a bit irritated, but they endured. Yeah, that's what I was saying. A lot of times the corals can adapt to what we're doing. Fortunately, they're not so crazy picky that if we do one drop of water wrong, they die. You know, it, if we're lucky, it's not that bad. But, you know, the, the more we can keep things as consistent as possible, the, the usually the better our success. Thank you, Dances with Fishes. She said uh, the tray is beautifully made and looks like it'll last a long time. Yeah, it should. It just doesn't do good on concrete. Don't drop it. <laughs> Once acrylic hits concrete, it's usually in pieces. Uh, Julian says, I hope I don't get anything for my reef for Father's Day. It might not be compatible with what I've got. And that's not me being ungrateful, but store credit would be better. That sounds like something you should tell your spouse <laughs> or your kids. Uh, you're right. Uh, another thing that can that you can do, you can if you're trying to buy something for a spouse. If you're listening to the show and you're looking for inspiration, you could see what kind of stuff they have around the tank or under the tank and get them more of the same. So I don't know, maybe they have a certain additive that they seem to be buying regularly. You buy them another bottle of that, or you know, you see that they. Um, Maybe they need a new cleaning magnet to clean the glass. I mean, there's different dry goods that you can always get someone as a gift that will make their reefing experience better. And like for me, I remember at one point with my tank, actually my reef tank right now, my 400 gallon, it has two cleaning magnets. It has one on the back and it has one on the end that comes around to the front. I can't do the whole uh, three sides because of the way the plumbing is. So I have one back there, I work the back of the tank and then the other one I work the front and I work the side. And that worked out really well. But if I only had one and someone says, I'm going to buy you a present for Father's Day, I would say, get me a second magnet. That would be super awesome to make my life easier. Thank you, Andrea, for putting that link there. All right. Um, I'm almost scared to click this. Let's see what happens. Yeah, see, it's not the worst. There you go. It's time to remind you that it is water test Saturday. Please do test your water, test everything. Make sure everything's right. Don't say it's fine. <laughs> Don't be lazy, use your test kits. We wanna make sure that our temperature is right, our salinity is right, our alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphate, nitrate. Uh, we wanna make sure everything's right because if they're not, we can make corrections now before the corals and the fish are affected. Someone uh, recently posted a picture of a fish that they'd had for, it was a hippo tang. And I think they said they'd had it for 10 years or 20 years. It was a long time. And a lot of the face was really eroded badly. And it reminded me of a fish that I bought used back in 2002. So I don't know what happened with that guy's tank, but he was asking, was that normal for the hippo tank because it's old? And I don't think it is. I think there was either a nutrition problem or there was a, a, a water parameter that was really bad for a really long time that just ate away at this fish. and gave it the look of HLLE, which is head, head and lateral line erosion. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's fixable, but it takes time. So anyway, let me talk to you about my fish from 2002. I bought a used 55 gallon aquarium and the water measured 200 ppm nitrate when I got it. And I was like, wow. And I wanted to get the nitrate down as quick as I could. And I thought, well, the only way I can do it is through a series of big water changes. And at the time I didn't have my big blue barrels. This was 2002. I had buckets. So I ended up getting a few of the 34 gallon trash cans and I mixed up my salt water in that. I'm trying to remember exactly what I did, but I remember I was like pumping water out and pumping water in and I kind of did back and forth a few water changes. So I was like hitting it with new water, but kind of circling through the old. It was because I was trying to avoid shock because if the nitrate was 200, I assumed it was something that just felt like electricity on their flesh. And that's probably me just, again, making up feelings for, for fish. But anyway, the coral beauty that I got, its whole face and half its body was just wrecked. It just looked so bad. And 
I focused on getting those nitrates way down from 200. And it, I did it in a matter of like two weeks flat and I had it down to something under 20. And then, you know, I just made sure to keep the water nice and clean and I fed the tank and, you know, I checked, I cleaned the skimmer collection cup regularly, you know. And anyway, nine months later, that coral beauty was completely perfect again. It had healed all of the, the scales, the skin, the flesh, and it just, you couldn't tell that coral beauty was in a bad spot in the beginning. It was completely healed. So if I had not tested my water to know that the water was 200, and that was the water that came with the tank, okay? <laughs> it was not my tank at the time. I bought the tank used with everything in it. It was a deal. And uh, I said, okay. And then I came home and I'm measuring everything. I was like, oh my God. But measuring your tank is the only way you'll know if something's wrong. And once you know what's wrong, you can make the corrections. You can do it however you want to do it. You can do it gradually. You can do it rapidly. You can, you can uh, use different prongs of methods to correct problems. I usually like to pick one problem at a time. Like if I'm working on nitrate, I don't want to sit there and, and fight phosphate too, or I don't want to uh, dose trace elements. You know, I'm trying to do, I do one project with my tank at a time, get it through it, let the tank, you know, breathe in a, a, a sigh of relief, Mark's done, and then the next thing happens and I work on that. And that way you don't overdo too many things at once because if you change like 15 things at once, if the livestock survives it, you still don't know which was your correction. You just know you did 15 things. So if you can focus on what was wrong to correct the nitrate, great. And then the next thing you can tackle is phosphate, which as you know, phosphate RX is my solution. It's really easy. If your alkalinity is too low, you can use soda ash to bring it up. If uh, your calcium is too high, stop dosing it. <laughs> you know, uh, if magnesium isn't enough, we can mix up a batch of magnesium sulfate, magnesium chloride, and we can dose that into the tank using reef chemistry calculator to determine how much and for how long to get that number right. And by measuring with test kits, you can see your progress and you know when to stop doing what you're doing because it's enough. We wanna make sure that we're doing just the right amount to help the livestock, to keep things healthy and clean and, uh, and hopefully have thriving animals. These are our pets. Uh, Rob says, what's your favorite nitrate test kit? <laughs> I have been using API for years because it would measure all the way up to 80 and above. But now that my numbers are lower, I could st finally use something. Uh, ELOs for me was not, was too low. I think the maximum I could handle is 25. So at this point, I probably could use it, but um, I don't know. I might even try the Hannah Checker finally because they came out with a nitrate one. I'm curious. But I haven't tried the NIOS one, so thanks for bringing that up, Rob. Um, and then if you're testing every Saturday, like I recommend, and you do it at the same time every Saturday, you can literally watch your trends. You can see, especially if you saved it in something like a reef trace, because then you'll see your alkalinity and you can watch the graph and see how it did over the last six weeks or eight weeks or three months. And you can, you can uh, track your progress. If you do it at 7 a.m. one day and 9 p.m. another day, pH will never look right because pH is way lower early in the morning than it is at night. Uh, again, if you're running dosers and you're putting in alkaline in the morning and calcium in the evening and you're doing your testing at 4 p.m., you'll get one result. But if you test at 10 p.m., you'll get a different result because you just dosed something in the tank a few hours ago. So we want to have the same time of day once a week so everything is con cohesive. So it's it's something you can mimic and you can compare. And so yeah, the best you can do is stay on top of it and be good about doing this every single week and do it at the same time if you can, that would be ideal. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in this week. Um, I will be again here on this channel <laughs> next Saturday and we'll have another fun topic to discuss. Bye guys.